I, uh, so I, I want to make sure that we have enough time for this last, last section. Uh, so I think I'll reserve uh, this last bit and just drop the fourth one. But before we get to that, I, I also just want to mention on the Green New Deal, you know, uh, check out Ryan Pollock's work who I've had on TMBS. Uh, he wrote a great piece in Jacobin. You know, he's a union organizer in Texas who was able to get them to pass a Green New Deal style resolution through the AFL-CIO. And you have to understand in Texas, that means people who are working, you know, either directly or indirectly with oil and gas. And the way that they were able to do that was to drop, um, you know, any acknowledgement of, you know, to AOC, even dropping the Green New Deal as like something as like a slogan, but rather federal economic policy. But what won people over was what Ben was just talking about, paying people, um, you know, their salaries to allow them to transition and to allow the union to take leadership roles in, you know, in the industry. And that worked successfully. Um, but this last bit, I, I'm really excited for this um, because I think it really does tie into um you know, the kind of pop understanding of, of what's going on in the economy and why people are really struggling to, you know, achieve the kind of prototypical American dream, you know, you get a job, you're able to provide for yourself, is this narrative about technology, right? And that we have reached such a, you know, our, our technology is so advanced now that, you know, that, uh, you know, that means that wages necessarily have to go down. And one person who, you know, he didn't do super well in the primary, but really invigorated a lot of people, uh, you know, was Andrew Yang talking about the UBI. Uh, universal basic income as a solution to that, you know, basically evacuating the labor struggle or the fight for fair wages or all these other things and just saying that we just need to, you know, support people directly because there is no possibility of having a functional, um, you know, economy that can provide for people anymore because of technology. So I obviously um, betray some of my feelings about that, that idea, but I'd like to talk about, uh, you know, technology and uh, unemployment in this last section. And I'll kick to you, Ben, uh, to talk about this because I know we've done a lot on, you you know, Yang and also this kind of idea that technology itself is what is driving unemployment. Yeah. So or under as, as, right, right. So I mean, as far as the the last part of the question, you know, uh, the extent to which technological changes, as opposed to other factors, are actually driving, you know, is actually driving unemployment, and the extent to which that'll be long term, I will defer to the uh, the actual economists here. Uh, but uh, but I think the uh, there are some some big picture things that are worth worth saying about this. Um, that you know one is has to do with the limits of of that kind of like yang uh program which i think you're right some people were really responding to because uh he seemed to be taking the problem seriously that you know oh you you have um you have all this unemployment and you know you need some sort of direct government assistance you know to to do something about it i mean that alone uh you know st like struck people as um you know, I, I mean, it goes back to what uh, Richard Wolf was saying about West Virginia, you know, recognition, you know, like, mm -hmm. like, like just that, just that recognition meant mm -hmm. something. And I think it also goes to the point about that sort of learned um, skepticism about what government's actually going to do uh, that, you know, a lot of more radical structural changes, unfortunately, sound very unrealistic to lots of people right now. Okay, could you get a check? All right, you could imagine that, right? You could imagine getting a check. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, but I think that once you actually start to think about um, you know what that would look like, uh, you know it's I mean it's it's just uh, grotesquely inadequate, especially if it's the uh, the the a la carte uh, UBI, which which I think realistically you know I mean if if it you know if it happened, unfortunately I think is what we get, uh, you know ra rather than a UBI that some leftists have advocated as part of a suite of programs that would address various other needs and you know various other ways, uh, but if you uh, if you just got it uh, one uh, it would actually likely be used as an excuse. Uh, to cut other kinds of government assistance. Look, we're already giving people a check. Why do we also need to provide them with X, Y, or Z? Mm -hmm. uh, two, uh, it would immediately be eaten up, right? I mean, look, if you know, uh, if I'm, if uh, if you're a landlord and you know that all of your tenants uh, are are getting an extra thousand dollars in the mail now, then uh, why wouldn't you just raise the rent? You know, what's what's going to stop you from doing that? Now, there are things that we could do to stop people from doing that, but at that point, you're talking about a much more ambitious program uh, mm -hmm. than than just uh, than just cutting people a check. And just on a really you know big picture point, uh, I think that whether it's true or not, and certainly I think there are you know, again, I'm sure Richard and Mark will speak more to this part. 
I do believe there are reasons to be skeptical about this, if nothing else, from the fact that we've heard it so many times before. Uh, you know, you can find lots of stuff in, you know, in, in the 80s, the 70s, you know, people saying the robots are coming for all the jobs. Now, maybe there'll, you know, there'll come a point when it's true, right? You know, just because just something hasn't come true a number of times in the past doesn't necessarily mean that it never will. Uh, but I think that I think that maybe the last point I make about this would just be that, look, let's say for the sake of argument that this time it will that this mm-hmm. time it really is true that developing technology will uh, will t- will lead to long-term mass unemployment in a way that it hasn't before. Well, if that's true, um, just sending people yang bucks every month is a grotesquely <laughs> inadequate solution to that problem. Uh, and one that could really start looking like the, you know, like, uh, you know, bread rations in the you know late Roman Republic, you know, when you had all these people who used to be small farmers, you know, who, uh, who had been bought up by big landed estates ended up as paupers in Rome. And so mm-hmm. you start instituting the daily bread ration. So they have enough to eat that they don't starve to death uh, or, uh, or, you know, or riot, uh, and uh, and undermine you know the uh, the the power structure uh, in Rome you know that's really what you know that's the sort of grim cyberpunk dystopia you know vision that uh, that the uh, that the Yang UBI program really sounds like to me and and look if it if it is true right if it were for the sake of argument true that we really are going to get the long term mass technological unemployment this time that actually gives us much more of a reason. You know, just just go full commie on this. You know, that gives us much more of a reason to care who controls the means of production, because uh, if it is a a small class of capitalists who own the machines and the machines are doing all of the work, then that's very bad news for the rest of us. Um, And, Mm. you know, our, our best case scenario is some equivalent to that Roman bread ration. If, on the other hand, the machines are collectively owned, democratically owned, uh, then uh, and if the machines are doing much of most of the work, that's fantastic because because uh, we can just spread around what remaining work still needs to be done by humans, so nobody has to work very much, and everybody can have the same standard of living. So sometimes people present this as if oh, this sort of like old-fashioned 19th-century socialist question about ownership of the means of production is irrelevant because of these technological changes or you know supposedly this coming mass technological unemployment. I'd say that if uh, that if the prediction was actually true this time that would actually make those questions much more urgent if i could uh, comment i i would like to play the economist card here for a moment um i think that'll save me doing it yeah no 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 uh, we'll make a duet out of it Um, it. the uh (laughs) i think we need to separate the question of employment from the question of technology, the attempt to link those as if they have a necessary one-to-one correspondence is a terrible um, collapse in the face of, of neoclassical economics and things like that, that we shouldn't and do not need to do. Let me illustrate it with a simple arithmetic. Suppose we're producing something and we have, we spend a hundred bucks on uh, workers and a hundred bucks on materials and we produce uh, some shit and we sell it for whatever, 300, okay? And now a machine comes along that is twice as productive as before. So as we use up the existing machines and we replace them with the new ones, everybody is twice as productive as they were before. Uh, So what now happens, we know with capitalism, what is going to happen is that uh, there go there yeah, go Marx yeah. Keep going. <laughs> with, cap- with capitalism, the employer has a clear incentive. He's going to fire half the workers right. because the other half are now twice as productive. Let's keep this example simple. They will now produce the total output before, but with half the labor force. He will sell it as before, earn the same revenue, assume a constant price. There's no reason here not to uh, and basically he profits as a, he gains in profit the one half of his payroll that he doesn't have to pay to those workers anymore so it's great for him he fires the workers everything else is the same and by the way this is a wonderful incentive for technical progress that the capitalist gains from right but now let's look at a, an alternative scenario. 
He says to the, the workers, or the workers say to him, okay, we're now twice as productive as before. Uh, we want everything to stay exactly as it was. You pay us what you paid us before. You buy the new machines, just like you did before, same cost, because it's the same price of the machine, it's just twice as effective. You'll produce the same amount, you'll sell it, everything will be the same. But we will all work four hours a day, not eight. Mm. The profit is the same. The revenue is the same. The benefit of the technology has accrued as leisure to the workers rather than profit to the capitalist. Hello, that's what we're interested in. We, we're not Luddites. We want the technical change because we could benefit. But what blocks us is capitalism and the way it works, which puts the decision of how to utilize the technology in the hands of a person who's going to do it in manner A and impose that on the workers rather than having the majority decide to use the technology for the benefit of the majority in the form of a transformation of their life, half the hours of labor, same wage as before. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I've done the work. I can assure you the, the arithmetic is no proof. There's no problem. But it's a wonderful illustration that you could have massive technological change that would make the life of the mass of people better if it was used in a particular way and was not held hostage to the profit criterion, which is now why it's a terrible fear that AI or robotics will destroy our jobs rather than make our lives better. Mm. That's a very old socialist argument, but it holds water brilliantly. I totally agree. I, I'll take it in a slightly different direction. I, I, I want to put the issue of UBI to one side. I think it's a yeah, very yeah. complex issue. And just look at the technology unemployment one. Plug for a book. If you want to make that case, this is the smartest case, right? This is the one. That's it's the a really good thing. And the basic story here is it's not technology, and it's dead easy to understand why. Because if technology was doing this, technology if measured as productivity would be going up. It's falling. But what's happening is output because of global overcapacity is falling even faster. So it looks like productivity is increasing, and that's causing unemployment. It's actually not. It's the fact that you have so much overcapacity globally in manufacturing. And everybody been steading it since the 1970s that basically the game is over in terms of that being a growth engine and we don't have a new one to pick it up. So if you want to link it, that's the way to link it. I'm almost convinced by that, but I've always had a problem with overcapacity arguments in the sense that they're intensely structural. They take things that, that's really a flow as a kind of a stock. And here's what I mean by that. If the problem is you've got too much capacity, increase demand. Right. Technically, there's no way, there's no reason you can't do that. So you can imagine a world in which, and this was very much the key to the kind of the Fordist post-war economic model, if you basically increase your capital stock with a constant share of labor productivity, as those workers get more productive, if they're able to claim their share of productivity, you're going to increase consumption. That increase in consumption means more final demand, which basically absorbs the extra production. Right. So in principle, there is a solution to this. The second thing is, it's a bit of a lump of labor, right? There's only a certain amount of work to be done. And once we've done it, there's no work left. Now, when you immediately think like, that's just that's nonsense, right? Now, look, we were talking earlier about, you know, decarbonization, Green New Deal, whatever you want to call it, right? Just think about the following. 30% of US carbon emissions come from the fact that we build the shittiest buildings in the OECD, right? Your windows are not quite as bad as the English, which are painted shut, single pane, but they're, they're getting there, right? Drywall, two by fours, the whole lot, terrible insulation, whole lot. So you're going to have to refit every building in a country of 330 million people to get your, that down. That's a 30-year project involving work and lots of it. So the notion that there's no work and it's all going to be done by robots, right? It's just garbage. My final example of this, right, is around 2010 when all this started with the whole sort of race against the machine and all these books coming out and the Oxford report, and we're all going to be the place, right? It's happening right in the middle of a financial crisis with mass unemployment. 
I mean, talk about taking the finger to people. I mean, the, the Financial Times was brilliant to read at that point because it was almost like, you know all you people that just blew up the world? Here's a great investment opportunity for you now. You've been bailed out. Let's really go screw everyone, right? And that's what it sounded like. But the thing was, it was just people hawking bits of the sky to each other. Today, Uber sold its self-driving car division at a loss because it doesn't work. I could have told them that 10 years ago. It's ridiculous, right? The other one was so many people in the United States bought this argument about technology, particularly in trucking, was going to do in trucking, that by 2014, I think it was, the whole industry was short 120,000 drivers. And wages were rising faster in trucking than anywhere because you couldn't get people who had the licenses because nobody invested in them because they were all going to be replaced by robots. Self-fulfilling horseshit, right? <laughs> so, you know, I'm deeply skeptical of the technology stuff. If there is a link, it's that. And I think that that one is not as hard and fast as it's often made out. Hmm. Yeah, maybe when we, uh, we refit all the buildings, you know, for the uh, green technology, we can also put back in light switches. <laughs> yes, definitely. That's a, a big, big fun. Big I mean, fun really, you know, it, it becomes crazy. Mark is absolutely right. We, we are a disaster as a society in terms of providing a decent retirement for people who have done their life's work. Right. There, there is a vast set of programs that, could, that need staffing that can't be done by robots to help provide a, a reasonable uh, life for, for a fast growing segment of our population, the older folk. We likewise, we don't have anything like the quality daycare that masses of young people with children. I mean, there mm. is no end to what we could do. There is no unemployment problem, except that it, our rule is nobody gets a job unless it's profitable for someone else to do that. It yeah. was crazy, an arrangement like that. It always was crazy. And I, that's part of the old socialism that we have to rediscover, rewrite it a little bit for the modern idiom. But it, it's right there, and much of that work has been done. Mm. Well, I think, uh, you know, so we don't go too long. I think that might actually be a perfect place uh, to sell things up. I wish we could, you know, continue talking for a bunch longer. Um, well, but luckily this, you have a show and you can have us all back on. I would love to do that sometime <laughs> soon. I know we didn't even get into, honestly, like Prop 22 and the fact that like that's what Uber's worried about, by the way. The self-driving cars are one thing, but being able to redefine labor laws, there's a reason that they're very fixated on that. So maybe that's a teaser for another conversation down the line. Um, but thank you so much, Mark, Richard, and Ben, for being here for this great conversation and also, you know, spending a little bit of time remembering, remembering our, you know, our good friend, Michael Brooks. Thanks, it's David. a pleasure. He was a great fellow. He brought us together. He spoke to a generation of people that needed and wanted what he was producing. And when he started, it wasn't available. And he's a major provider of that. And we will all be in complex ways in his debt for years to come. I'm full. No question. Said. Well, thank you all. Thank you.